There oh, it is. Right. I so I think we're recording. Um, I'm Nate, the restoration and trails coordinator for uh, Wildlands Restoration Volunteers. I've got two co-instructors today. I'll let them introduce themselves. Is that Jackie? Yeah, Jackie's one of them. Hi everyone, I'm Jackie. Uh, I'm Jackie Curry. I'm one of the project coordinators for Wildlands Restoration Volunteers. Um, been doing these, this type of work for about five years or so um, with a bunch of other um, slew of towns under my belt, but I will be at El Dorado Canyon with you all next Saturday um, with Mick to um, for that training. So good to meet you all. <laughs> Thanks, Jackie. Yes. So you're based out of the Boulder office, Jackie? Yes, I'm currently living in Lakewood. I work out of the Boulder office and we've just now moved our office to Longmont. And oh, I'll that's be right. In a couple of weeks. So no, is the uh, Boulder office now closed and moved? Everything was moved out yesterday and oh. everything is going to be finalized. The walkthrough happens on Monday. Great. Well, when's the housewarming? <laughs> Great question. 2022. Oh, so Somewhere down the line. Not sure yet. All right. <clears throat> uh, I'm Mick Sizek, folks. For those of you who don't know me, in the last couple of years, I've been at uh, Nate's Heels pretty much at Young Gulch, but I've been an instructor in the trails world with uh, various organizations, and that includes WRV for the last. Uh, I would say since 2006, I started helping with crew leader trainings. Uh, actually, some of the first ones at uh, what is now St. Frayn State Park. So uh, welcome aboard, folks. Uh, I've got 27 years behind me, but I don't know everything. So it's going to be a collaborative effort, and we're going to have fun. Thanks, guys. Uh, Ian, why don't you introduce yourself and... Uh, I'm not sure what order you appear on your screens, but we'll start with Ian and, and, and move one direction or the other. <laughs> um, I'm I'm a, one of the volunteers for um, WRV, hoping to learn some more about um, trail building. I did the eco restoration um, training last year. Um, I, I currently, in my um, non-volunteer time, I work for an um, ecological nonprofit in Fort Collins called the Coalition for the Clear River Watershed. And I'm excited to get out there this summer because of the COVID stuff. I've been in a house all, all, all spring. I'm sorry, Ian, who did you say you work for up here in Fort Collins? Uh, Coalition for the Poudre River Watershed. Is that with John, Jan, uh, Jen mm -hmm. Kovacsis? Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Well, well, next on my screen is Bobby. All right, hey everybody, I'm Bobby. Uh, Started volunteering with WRV last year. Did a lot of backcountry projects with Nate. Um, did mostly, I guess we got our hands dirty too, but we did a lot of photo and video work, uh, but that definitely inspired me to learn more. And I was very fascinated by the, the technical process of, of building and maintaining and restoring trails. And um, yeah, really excited to learn more. Saw you. I think that was your video that we saw put put together from where was it up in uh, Indian Peaks? Yeah, yeah, it was a, a few different trips. Um, I want to say it was Indian Peaks, a Young Gulch one, and then uh, some from Mount Albert too. Uh, but yeah, it was at the uh, thank you dinner for for volunteers. Great. Yeah. yeah, it was fun to do. Hope hoping to continue doing that on on some projects too. All right. Thanks, Bobby. Kate, you're the last one. All right. Uh, I'm Kate. I started volunteering last year, um, right at the end of the season, actually, because I just moved out to Colorado. Um, I did the women's only, I guess the inaugural women's only <laughs> uh, project. So I, I thought I would like to get more involved. Um, normally, I work in tech. Uh, I'm between jobs right now, thanks to coronavirus. Uh, so lots of free time on my hands. Um, and I'm training for both uh, trail restoration and eco restoration. Nice. All right, well, welcome, everybody. Um, this is just intended to be a pretty brief orientation uh, this afternoon. Um, 
usually we get at the end of the in-person training, you know, maybe 45 minutes to an hour to, you know, do a little classroom time, introduce concepts and, um, and do some question and answer before we're out in the field and uh, where there's less opportunity to do some of those things. Um, we have up to an hour and a half today. I don't know if it'll take us that long, uh, depends on questions. Um, but uh, let's go ahead and get started. I'm gonna share my screen. I've got a, a PowerPoint presentation we'll work through. Uh, Co-instructors, please feel free to interrupt me anytime I am making no sense whatsoever or marginal sense, um, does happen. And um, trainees, please feel free to ask questions at any time. Um, all right, can everybody see this? Wow, Pawnee. Yeah, so we're gonna get to do some work on the Pawnee grasslands this fall, we hope. Um, um, so I'm really excited. We haven't been out there since, was it 2012? I think it was the last time we worked on this trail um, and it got, pretty wiped out by the flooding in 2013, right after we rebuilt a bunch of it. Um, hmm. So this is just a little teaser uh, for those of you who are excited about working uh, where there's no shade whatsoever on trails and really interesting terrain. Um, basic things we're gonna cover today, some very basic trail terminology. We won't go through everything. Um, some trail design concepts. Uh, trail design can be a multi-day, um, you know, sometimes three days worth of training uh, just for the overview. So obviously we're not going to go into de depth here, but we'll introduce some concepts. Uh, the basic steps in trail construction. We'll go over some documents that are common on trail projects at WRV. Uh, look at some trail tools. Uh, and then give you all a chance to ask additional questions um, that haven't come up during the presentation. Any questions? Uh, yes, I wanted to ask, uh, <clears throat> have you sent out any documentation for the trainees to study so far? We have not. We don't have final documents for the training together yet, so I don't want to send those out uh, before they're ready. Um, okay. But... Um, <clears throat> We'll, we'll look at some examples today. Great, great. So at uh, the field training in the Eldo, they're gonna get a three ring binder or a notebook or something. Oh. Yes, they'll get the standard um, trails training handbook um, and the, you know, you can't even see those, can you? There we go. <laughs> and the, uh, the handy key things. cards uh, reference. Uh, all that okay. will happen during the in-person training. Okay, very good. Um, I think some documents have been sent out in bits and pieces in PDF format as well. Hmm. It. I think you've sent the waiver out, but that's about all that I remember seeing. Okay. Um, some of the um, OSI materials have been sent out in bits and pieces. Uh, trainees have been going through uh, some of those modules bit by bit online um, with our instructors over the last few weeks. Okay. Uh, so some of that's already out there. All right, let's talk trail terminology. Um, most of you have seen all this, so we won't spend a ton of time. Um, but the um, it's important to understand what you know some of these words mean because they'll get thrown at you in the middle of um, a trail construction project, and uh, we want to use as consistent terminology as possible uh, so we don't confuse our volunteers. Um, there are multiple names for most of these terms, depending on who you work for, um, where you're working, um, and, and who the leadership is, but we're going to try to be as standard as possible. Um, so our cross slope is, can you see my cursor? Yeah. Awesome. Does it have like a little Nathan on it or something? No. No, just a regular cursor? Okay. Well, that's not as exciting as it could be. So our cross slope 
is the slope of the terrain we're working in um, before the trail exists. Uh, so we often try to put our trails on a cross slope um, because it helps facilitate drainage. Um, drainage is one of those, you know, primary concerns when designing and building a trail. So if we can put it on a space that will drain on its own, uh, that is certainly helpful. Um, <clears throat> so we're always looking to put, place our trail in, in, on a cross slope. Uh, once we dig a tread into our trail, the tread is the space that folks will be walking on. Um, then we also create some new slopes because that cuts out a back slope. Um, the tread itself also has an out slope to it. Um, if you make a tread completely flat, then it's more likely to retain water or channelize water along the trail. If you inslope it, uh, obviously it's going to do that. It's going to trap water. So we try to build our trails with a bit of an out slope. Uh, three to five percent is pretty common uh, to encourage water to uh, cross our trail in, in sheet flow rather than, than concentrating in a spot. Um, and finally, the critical edge, uh, that is, um, as its name um, in, you know, indicates, it's a very important part of our trail. Um, a, a poorly defined critical edge or a, a poorly constructed critical edge can lead to decline in the trail uh, very rapidly. So we want to we pay a lot of attention to the, the shape of the critical edge. Uh, and finally, below the critical edge, what was our cross slope um, is now our uh, down slope. You'll see, hear that called many names, down slope or fill slope. Um, we try to build trails in Colorado where we don't have any fill on that down slope. Uh, so we try to stay away from that terminology. Uh, any questions or clarifications there? Do we need to make any distinction between full bench and partial bench at yes. this time? Oh, there it is. Uh, thanks, Mick. That brings us to our next slide. Um, so the previous slide, we were looking at a trail that was built um, full bench. That means that the entire width of the uh, tread is built into undisturbed soil. Um, and in Colorado, with the soils we have here, we almost always try to build our trails at full bench. Um, obviously, there are times when that's not possible. Uh, and so we'll build a, a partial bench trail. And in Colorado, with our soils that tend to have a lot of decomposed granite, um, our trails don't pack in very well once they've been disturbed. So if we're going to build a partial bench trail, so this is the part of the trail here that was built in undisturbed soil. And then we can see we have about a third of our tread here that's built on top of fill. Um, we have to put in some kind of hardened structure to hold that fill in place if we're gonna build a partial bench trail. Um, there are parts of the world and in, in, in the US where the soils um, are conducive to building a, a, a cut and fill tread where you simply just cut out this stuff and you chuck it over here and tamp it in good and voila you got yourself a trail. Um, we definitely don't have those soils here. Um, also in, in places where that, that tends to be the case they have other challenges with the vegetation that we don't have here so it's a it's a, there's certainly trade-offs. Um, so we always design our trails as full bench. There are certainly times when partial bench is necessary in which case uh, this is a rock. Uh, we build mono walls in order to hold that, the, the fill in place. Questions there? Anything else to add, Mick? Yeah, that's this concept of uh, disturbed soil in our environment, our soils environment, is a good one to grasp. And I'll, you know, we'll, I'll bring it up uh, out at El Dorado there. The concept being that once it's disturbed, no matter how much we pack it, even in a structure like this, if partial fill, it probably is not going to compact as well as Mother Nature has over the eons. It's just the nature of our granular uh, granite soils. Uh, so my approach is typically you can always take off more, but once you've taken it off and you find you got to fill something, 
you've cre created a potential for either erosion or a mud hole. So disturbed soil concept. Yeah, uh, to follow up on that, you know, sometimes you've got to pull, you've got to disturb more soil than you wish you had, or sometimes you accidentally disturb more soil than you wish you had. Um, and that can lead to problems with, um, you know, alter the design of the trail uh, from what we had intended and then we'll have to rethink it or we have to try to fill it somehow. Um, and that usually means packing in hardened material into whatever space that is. Uh, it ends up making a lot more work than it would have been just to be a little bit more careful in, in cutting the, the tread uh, to the uh, proper, appropriate de uh, depth to begin with. Um, so definitely uh, keep that in mind as you're as you're introducing this to your crews. I thought I thought you were going to tell me I was getting lazy in in my advancing youth there. <laughs> oh no no, um, there's nothing wrong with being a lazy trail builder as long as you're building good trail. Um, <laughs> you can certainly overdo it uh, unnecessarily. You can also yeah. certainly be a lazy trail builder who builds bad trail and. That will not be happening on WRV projects. Here, here. All right, some basic trail design concepts. Bobby, you had a question? Yeah, just one quick question. Uh, if you could go back to the last slide, um, that gray figure, that is a rock, I presume. Um, yes. Is that something that would, that is something that we would be adding in in this particular scenario, right? Okay. Correct. So we're in a situation here where we, for whatever reason, maybe um, the terrain was too tight and we weren't able to, to cut full bench or what often happens is we you know, design a trail and we figure out, find out that there's a whole lot more organic material over here than what we wished. Um, or the, the soil down here just isn't stable enough to hold up our critical edge the way we wished it would. And so we end up adding um, retaining structures like like this rock um, in order to hold our critical edge. I mean the other option here is we sink our tread deeper and we put our tread down here. Um, that can work well um, but it may uh, it may change the way our trail drains in, an, in, you know, in a way that we, do, we won't, don't wish and so sometimes that's not possible or sometimes we can dig the tread back into the back slope more. Um, depending on what the substrate looks like, that may not be possible either, in, in which case, um, and it also changes our drainage, uh, in which case we go to the mono wall. Um, we'll get a little bit more into some of those drainage concepts in, in just a little bit. There are some cases where we may utilize the feng shui of the landscape and find a beautiful rock to incorporate into the trail tread and it'll still look like that or we'll be rolling right over it as part of the main tread. Right. I would like to point out <coughs> that from the tread, if you're walking along this tread and you looked at this rock, how big would it look like that rock is? It would look tiny, well, small. <laughs> yeah, so this rock isn't going to look very big. Um, you know, the, the user's only going to see the little bit that's poking out. Um, and often these rocks are buried well into the and underneath the tread in order to, for them to be stable enough to actually hold up this trail. So, for example, if this was an equine rated trail uh, and we have horses traveling through here, you know, the weight <laughs> of a horse stepping on a smaller rock here is not going to, it's not going to hold our critical edge. And so we're going to be putting in pretty massive uh, pieces of material in order to hold that. Uh, nonetheless, the user is only still going to see the very tip of the rock. Um, and so it's very common for new trail builder volunteers to come in having experienced this visually and not having built one before. Yeah. Uh, and when you ask for a, you'll find a rock to build a, a mono wall, they'll bring you something about the size of a cantaloupe, um, which isn't going to do it for you. Um, so often our, our work is underappreciated because it looks like we put a bunch of small rocks next to a trail, uh, whereas, you know, the truth is <laughs> they have put in a bunch of, you know, 150, 200 pound rocks in the end of the tread and buried them underneath. Uh, the other thing I'd like to point out here is this rock does not extend above our critical edge. 
um, what would happen if we built this mono wall and it extended maybe up here above the word fill? What would that do to our hyd hydrology? We would retain more water, I presume. Yeah, so we're basically we'd be building a trench instead of a trail. Um, and even if only portions of the rocks extend above, um, we're still going to cause some water to, to remain on the trail. Um, and one of the long-term problems with trails is they tend to get burned, which means this part of the tread gets used, this part of the tread gets material kicked on it, and it forms a berm over time. Uh, if we are building structures that, it, that actually encourage that, we're, we're going to expedite that process um, yeah. and the kind of maintenance that it, it takes to, to fix it. Uh, so we want to, we want these things to be hidden. We don't want the, you know, our mono walls to be overly apparent to the users uh, or to cause, you know, hydraulic problems. Any questions on that? I think that might have answered my question, but mine was about whether you'd want the tread to go the full width to the critical edge or whether you want to leave a gap so that people aren't sort of putting their weight right on that corner. Yeah, generally we want the tread to go all the way to the critical edge. Um, ideally, users are uh, taking advantage of the entire width of the tread. Uh, if they don't, this will start getting full of vegetation here, uh, and that will also help start leading towards that berming problem that we end up with. Um, but you're right, over time, people do tend to walk away from the critical edge, um, which causes the, you know, causes some trenching here, some berming here, um, and that takes maintenance over time. Um, if you build a tread that's too far outsloped, you'll have the opposite problem, and people will tend to walk right on the critical edge and beat it down, and the tread will actually creep inwards and narrow over time. Um, those are all concepts we'll, we'll talk about a little more as we're uh, constructing. And just to make sure I understand, um, the critical edge in this case is directly like underneath the F, right? Yeah, okay. Cool. Exactly, right here. Uh, your, this point here is, is often called the hinge point uh, or the inside edge, and this is your critical edge, and your tread is the space between. So when, we're, when we've been assigned you know, in the trail specs to build 24 inches of, of tread, uh, we want all 24 inches of that to be usable. I think Kate's question was leading into, uh, <clears throat> you know, building that monowall, should a monowall be utilized, is it gonna be considered part of the tread and therefore stability uh, considerations need to be, in other words, using bigger rock is gonna be more stable. Right. Uh, but we can, you know, rock walls and rock terminology, I don't think we're gonna get a lot of that at Eldo. I don't know how much you want, you know, that to be a part of the basic trail situation. We will probably get to do some rock work. Eldo is pretty famous for its <laughs> necessity for rock work. Um, I haven't seen uh, that site yet, but uh, we definitely did some rock work there last year and the year before. Um, I'll confer That's, with Jackie. I think we have a uh, Wednesday instructors meeting kind of thing, and uh, we'll just we'll talk about what ifs on that. Nice. Yeah. So, Kate, that also brings up another point. You know, if you had a rock, say, that filled up, that came all the way up and filled up this entire space, and then this rock would be this section of it would be part of the tread. Is that what you're part of what you might be getting at? Um, I was mostly just curious whether it, you wanted to sort of induce people away from the very edge to try to maintain that edge and not have it erode, but it almost sounds like we would prefer for it to erode than the opposite and, and build up that sort of hump that causes the, the drainage not to work. Yeah, I mean, we don't want to encourage it to erode, but we, we'd like to keep the critical edge, you know, right where we placed it, uh, whether that's realistic or not. Um, but we try to uh, design and construct these in such a way that it, it main, it's, maintains its critical edge as, as long as possible. Um, when we do place rocks, you know, there is a, a tendency among new trail builders to try to place rocks right underneath the tread surface. And th that does wear out over time. Um, there are some times when that's desirable, like when 
when you really need to harden the tread surface. But if you have an equine trail, horses really hate walking on rocks. Um, it can also become very slick for mountain bikes. Um, so in an ideal situation, we're burying these rocks down below and really only touching, you know, coming to the, the critical edge. Uh, so the rock isn't used for travel at all. Sure. Um, that being said, we always want to make sure they're stable enough that somebody did decide to travel on them or uh, kids decide to start climbing on them or, you know, things that would never happen on trails. Um, when people cut trail or whatnot, that the rocks are stable and won't get pulled out. All right, some basics of trail design. Um, first of all, uh, things we're just taking into account when we're designing a trail. Uh, one, what is the purpose of the of a trail? You know, is um, <clears throat> why do people go on trails? Anybody have a, a, a guess on that? I mean, I go on trails to build them, uh, and that's really just about it. But most people go on them for other reasons. Recreation. Recreation, absolutely. Getting what, from one point to another. Yeah, to, you know, to actually travel from one place to a, a desirable destination. Um, so, in it, when we're building a trail, we want to keep in mind what the intended purpose of this trail is. Sometimes we're building trails that just go from the parking lot to a destination, and so. Our design may be very different than a trail that's um, going in amongst some really cool rocks and some some features that people want to see or that people are going to use strictly for the enjoyment of the trail itself. Um, so we're keeping that in mind when we're uh, designing where the trail um, where the trail is going to go. Uh, the land management ag agency we're working with has a lot of say in our trail design. Uh, they're the ones that are going to tell us, hey, we want a 18 inch tread here. We want 36 inches here. Our maximum slopes are these and our um, And we're these are the types of, of landscapes. We want to keep our tread off of um, the basic uh, Feel and 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 specs for our tread our trail are, are usually defined by the agency that manages that that space um, whether the trail is new construction, you know, brand new, never been a trail here before, or whether it's a restoration or a reroute, um, has a lot to say in our design. Um, who is going to use our trail? Uh, like we were talking about before, if, if this is just for a, some hikers, uh, it may be a very different trail than if we're inviting mountain bikers and and horses, um, maybe it's an ADA trail, uh, and there's a lot, you know, a lot of res you know, more restrictive grades on uh, trails that are ADA rated. Um, so that use, intended use, uh, really does define our, our our trail design and, and you know kind of the, the, the grades and slopes we can get away with, uh, and the way we approach our turns and and gain altitude. Uh, the landscape we're working in, of course, makes a, a huge um, impact on our trail design. You know, if we're going across a, a bunch of meadows uh, near a pond, um, are we going through a, a mountain valley? Um, all those things um, inform the way our trail will be designed, and, and, it's, and that leads to hydrology. Um, you know, we want to look at our trail from not just the hydrology of the time we have to be walking in it. You know, we often design our trails in the spring when things are really wet, because um, that's right before our season, and we, we got to get out there. And we got to get things designed. Uh, we want to keep in mind, you know, what's this going to do during a storm? What's it going to do in the winter time? Uh, is this trail going to, you know, get visitation? You know, is it cross country skiers? Uh, um, are they going to be using it in the winter time? And how is the hydrology going to be different in all t all, all year round? Uh, sensitive habitat. You know, we more and more are trying to keep our trails out of um, floodplains and sensitive um, riparian zones next to water bodies of water. Um, but also, um, open meadows are really important habitat for wildlife. And 
if we are, if our trail runs through the forest where there's a lot of cover, we're affecting a lot less, a lot fewer acres of habitat than if we're in a wide open meadow uh, and there's no cover that, that wildlife can use or that, that is you know, obscuring us from, from influencing them. Attractive nuisances. Uh, anybody want to take a guess what some of those are? Um, you know, when we're, when we're designing a trail, there, <clears throat> there are things that people see on trail, and, and we've all been there walking down a trail, and oh, squirrel, but it's not a squirrel. It's a really cool looking rock, or you can hear like a waterfall in the background, and these are places that people are going to go whether we put a trail to those places or not. Um, so we either need to stay far enough away from those attractions that people don't pick up on them, or we need to find ways to incorporate them into our trail. Um, and there's a trade-off there often between creating a sustainable trail and a trail that's gonna hold up over time and a, and a trail that takes people to everywhere they wanna go. But that balance is important because if we don't take it there, then the people will take it there and they won't design a trail, they will just blaze a trail. Um, and it's never going to be as sustainable as something we, we design. So we often walk that tightrope between perfect hydrology and perfect people management. Uh, and finally, destination. Um, you know, is there a destination or is this um, just a trail that people are gonna take to wander and enjoy the space? Um, you know, we can often get to our destination in the most expedient way possible, but we may want to visit some attractive nuisances along the way and, and really enjoy the space if we are able to do so. Any questions here? All right. So when we are designing our trail, um, newer trails are designed very, very differently than trails were even a decade ago. Um, when I first started trail building, and, and Mick, I'm sure when you start first started trail building, we built a lot of water bars. We did a lot of check dams. I remember getting so good at building water bars. I was really proud of those things. Um, my, my biggest mistake was building trails that were too linear, too straight. Yep. Not enough, not enough of that um factor, you know, the undulation and meandering. Exactly. Um, we get a little, I mean, I grew up in Kansas where everything is just a straight line. You know, you, you go straight from point A to point B, all the roads are on a grid. Uh, you can fall asleep driving your car with your hand on the bottom of the steering wheel and just wake up an hour later and you're at your destination. Um, I brought that to my, some of my first designs as well. And um, while they were very efficient in getting people from point A to point B, uh, they're less enjoyable. They don't drain as well. Uh, they, and they look great when you first build them, but over time, as you start to see you know, that trenching or berming, um, you don't deal with water, and then you've got to come back and fix the problem. And that's when you have to start building water bars and, and grade checks. And we want to build drainage into the initial design of the trail. Um, so if you look at the picture here on the, uh, for the rolling contour trail, rather than putting water bars in our trail to get the water off, what we do is we build these, this undulation and the meandering, the um factor, as Nick was saying, of our trails. Um, and depending on the grade we're working in, this may be every 50, 100 feet that we're putting some kind of, of grade reversal in uh, to get water off the trail. Um, you know, if we put a water bar here, if we just put a straight trail and put a water bar here, Water bars take maintenance over time. They fall apart. Um, bikers hate them um, and they try to skirt around them. Hikers trip on them. Water collides with them and washes them out over time. Uh, so they just don't last. It takes a lot of erosion to pull out this pile of soil here. You can, you know, most of these things, the dip itself is maybe, um, 15 feet and then the rise is over another 15 feet. So it's a really a lot of material and it would take a lot to disrupt the hydrology or you know to start trenching that trail and actually taking the water down trail. So this Something. is a much more sustainable low maintenance design. Um, we built some of our first 
um, grade reversals on our trail construction at Hewlett Gulch um, years ago. And that trail held up to the storm of 2013, had no damage at all. Um, whereas some of the other trails we built um, with water bars and we had to go back and fix everything. Um, so this, this does work well and it reduces the maintenance over time for our land management agencies. And this is why it's so important to maintain our critical edge. Say if we built all this drainage in and we dug a little too deep right here and had to drop our tread, all of a sudden we may have lost this grade reversal that was built into the, the, um, the trail line to begin with. So it's always a good idea to try to maintain that as, as best as possible. And if you have to change things to check in with, uh, with whoever designed the trail to make sure we're getting it back in somewhere. Questions there? Part, part of this too, and we really can't see the vegetation, so it does uh, behoove us when we're installing, constructing a trail like this is to say, what are the grass patterns? Are those wettish? Is, are we building in a swale? Can we emphasize the swale and provide drainage where it's naturally occurring and make it sustainable and functional? Uh, these are all kind of site considerations. But the idea is we want to facilitate that sheeting action of water. Now, I always indicate to people that if you think of yourself as a wildlands trail plumber, a glorified one, <laughs> then, you know, that's going to keep the functionality of it. And we can always add the fun into the functionality, but we have to make it function hydrologically and get it to drain. That water... Here we get catastrophic water events and or snowmelt events. So we have to build for that. Exactly, Mick. And our, our basic trail design principle is if we, if we built this trail and for some reason it never ever got used and was not maintained, that the, it would not over time alter the hydrology of the site. You know, if it started to fall apart, it would fall apart in such a way that the hydrology would go back to where it was. Um, it wouldn't unravel without maintenance. And we can do that, by, like Mick said, by, by putting our drainages where the water is, is going anyway. If you have a swale, uh, build down into the swale and back up out of the swale so the water stays there. Um, if you're noticing those um, more uh, moisture loving species um, that may be a place to avoid putting a trail to begin with because maybe that's that gets wet and muddy and will will dish out over time um, all these things are are important considerations all right so there are six official steps to trail construction um, some people go with four some people I, I like to add the seventh um, <clears throat> But just about every agency has their own way to describe how, you know, the steps to building a trail. Um, for, from my perspective, yes, we can break these down into six or seven steps, um, but it's, it's kind of like a Western two-step. You do a couple of steps and then you end up going back and doing the step before, and then you might get a couple of steps and you end up going back and doing the step before. Um, it never goes in this linear fashion that we're presenting here, but we're gonna, for the sake of instruction, we're just gonna go through it in a linear fashion and, and talk about each of the steps. Um, so the first step is clearing the corridor. Um, that's basically just removing the vegetation um, and anything else that might be in the way of constructing the trail. So that's done with saws and loppers and uh, sometimes you're pulling pretty big logs off the trail, uh, just making the space buildable. Um, establish a starting point. I uh, so, wanted, wanted to just backtrack a bit. Part of the action of clearing a corridor is actually making it a safe working area as well. I mean, you're, you're definitely defining where the tread is going to go, et cetera, but cleaning it up, you're making a safe workspace for your, for your volunteers, and that's important. Yeah, Mick spent a lot of time helping and guiding chainsaw crews out in Young Gulch, making sure that you know, after it had burned through that there weren't hazard trees that would uh, 
fall on us while, we're, while we had crews out there constructing trails. So that's a very important point. All right, establishing your starting point. Um, that can mean a number of different things, um, but as far as uh, most of our crews work in discrete um, trail sections, we often divide our trails up into 100 foot sections and each crew is responsible for their 100 feet or something close to that, uh, um, that, they'll, that they can take off one bite at a time. Uh, they might finish 300 feet in a day, but they'll do it in 100 foot sections. Uh, so we need to decide where we're starting, where we're finishing, um, and make sure we understand how the trail flows in between. So usually when you arrive on, on site, you'll see a flag line. Um, and the flag line, generally, if WRV is flagging the trail, will be flagged along the critical edge. Uh, so that gives you your starting point. But often that's not enough for your crews. Um, sometimes those flags are you know, 15 feet apart or 20 feet apart. Maybe they're only four feet apart. But um, if you just connected the dots with straight lines, um, that'd be a very funny pixelated looking trail. Um, so we're looking for more of a flow along those lines. Like, you remember when you were a kid and you did a connect the dots? And when you first started doing connect the dots, you just went from one to two to three to four. Uh, in straight lines. We're looking for more of a flow between all the dots um, so that the trail feels like a trail, not a, not a series of straight lines. Um, so it's a good idea to demonstrate that for your crews. Maybe grab a Picmatic or a McLeod and scratch in that line so they can visualize what that trail is actually going to look like. Um, Establishing the initial tread surface, that's often called roughing in your tread, basically just getting the majority of the material out of the way down to where your tread surface is going to be. Um, you know, there are certainly trail builders who can cut from the surface down and get a perfect outslope, but most of us are not that trail builder. So we start by just getting a rough tread established, something we can travel across, uh, and then we'll, we can fine tune it later. Uh, we go from there to establishing our backslope. Um, <clears throat> so once you've you know, cut down to your initial tread, you've got a vertical, basically a vertical line behind uh, on the backslope. We want to cut that back. Some people say, you know, we we'll want 45 degrees. Some people say try to um, blend it in with the, the general cross slope. Um, that will be defined for you if there's a specific uh, angle we're looking for. I'm generally of the opinion that we're just trying to, basically what we're trying to do is not create points where water is going to speed up or slow down abruptly as it travels across our trail. So if we have, you know, we come across our, out, our cross slope is like this and all of a sudden it drops. This is the point here. Can everybody see my hands? Yeah. Everybody, this is the point here where water is going to speed up. What does water do when it speeds up? Well, that's a bad question. I, I worded that terribly. <clears throat> so there are, there are two factors, two characteristics, two uh, traits of water, of a body of water that enables it to carry more or less material. One is its speed or velocity and one is its volume. Uh, we don't get to say much about volume when we're building a trail, except that we're trying to keep it as spread out as possible. But we can control its velocity, at least to a certain extent. So if we have a gradual transition, uh, it's not going to increase its velocity and start pulling out material at, right there at the, the top of the back slope. Uh, and then it, what it does is it hits the bottom of the, the back slope and the tread, and all of a sudden it loses all this velocity. And so it's going to deposit the material there. It's called sloughing. And that's another way that we lose our tread. So if we can create a more gentle transition both onto the back slope and back onto the tread again, we're less likely to have that effect and our, our tread will stay intact longer. Can I, can I interject here? Can, can you guys see me what I'm doing here with my hands, my fingers? Yes. So 
that's I'm forming a W, and this is we'll go over this in at Eldo because it's a great little quick visual aid, a teachable moment type of thing. Exactly referencing what Nate was talking about there. I got the W here for water. Talking to you as a wildlands uh, plumber here, composed of two V's, the two forces that cause erosion. One is volume, and the other is velocity. So if we can diminish either one of those, plan as we go and facilitate again that sheeting action of water coming across the landscape. You know, we, we're accomplishing what we need to do functionally, minimizing the velocity, minimizing the volume, getting back to that sheeting flow of action of water. Thank you. Thanks, Mick. All right, so we've established, we're establishing the back slope. Um, it's really important here, and this is where the, the, the trail two-step often takes place, is this going between step three and step four. When you establish your initial tread surface, if, you don't, if your, your specs call for 24-inch tread and you don't quite get there, you maybe only get 18 or 20 inches, and then you establish your back slope, and then you measure and you're, you're short, then you got to go back to establishing your tread again. Then you have to reestablish your back slope. Um, I've seen this happen, you know, four times back and forth in the in the course of, you know, building a small section of trail. Um, so that's why it's really important, and we'll get to this in just a little bit to to make sure your your critical edge is clear and you know where it's at, um, and make sure that your crews aren't cutting corners because at the end of a long day. 24 inches seems really huge because it's a lot of work to build it, but it's a lot more to build, a lot more work to build it if you're doing 18 inches, then four more inches, uh, and then two more inches to get there. Um, so it's really important to, to help your crews to build it right and the right width the first time. Um, Got some techniques in my pocket, I'll show you. Perfect. All right, so we have been successful in getting our 24 inches. We have established our beautiful back slope that contours in and back out again, so water just can enjoy the ride and not pick up a bunch of tra bunch of passengers. Um, now we want to establish our outslope so that our trail drains correctly. Um, hopefully, we've kept this in mind as we're you know roughing in our tread. Um, but now we want to make sure it really does have that three to five inches, and you know, there are lots of methods. Or sort of three to five percent uh, outslope. There are a lot of methods for doing that. We have these um, these trail levels that are calibrated at, at three or five percent, and you can place down every four inches and um, and get your your outslope absolutely perfect. And then there are tricks using the clouds, and there are tricks you know where you stand and use your body and feel the trail. We'll practice all these on site. We're not going to talk about them now because. It would just be me doing a dance on pixels here and wouldn't be very helpful to anybody. So count on that on, on, on the field day. Uh, reclamation, ooh, that was not intentional. Reclamation and finish work. If we've done our job well up to this point, there is often very little finish work to do. There might be some rocks to set and, and some cleanup to do around some rock work. Um, but if we've, built our tread well, and we'll get into some of this in the next slide, um, the cleanup is pretty minimal. If we've been sloppy, step six can take as long as all the other steps put together. Um, we like to try to avoid that. Finally, step seven, admire your work. Um, enjoy it and you know, walk it with your crew, tell them how awesome they have been, how, how their hard work paid off. Um, really celebrate the work of the crew. All right, some pointers, and these are just some that I thought of in the last hour before we uh, um, started our, 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 our um, training. I'm sure that uh, my co-instructors have other things to add to this, um, but these are just my, you know, the ones that came to mind um, that, are, that are helpful. First of all, walk the entire length of your section with your crew. Uh, let them ask questions, point out potential difficulties. I, hopefully you've got a technical advisor that you can walk it with you. If not, um, you know, 
come up with a list of questions for your technical advisor if it does if your technical advisor does come through that you can address with them then because it it may be the the one chance you have before you you know bring your technical advisor back in to ask all the questions you want to ask so so have them ready make sure your entire crew has seen everything and understands what the questions are um, define the tread surface for unexperienced crews um, this is kind of what i was talking about before you know scratching in that critical edge so they can really envision it uh, with a really experienced crew i like to just scratch in the critical edge and then have a crew member with a mcleod just scratch off all the vegetation all the all the duff for the whatever the 24 36 inches it is that really helps your crews envision where the tread is going to go uh, and what the trail is going to look like and, and helps them to, to build it uh, according to the original vision. Uh, keep your fill slope clean. Um, there are a couple important, step, important steps to this. When you're first cutting your uh, critical edge, pull it in to what the, the tread will be. Never have your crew members standing in the, the down slope or the fill slope and pulling the material down off the tread. All that material will have to be cleaned up at the end and that can, to do it right, that's a lot of work. Um, and then once you've established that critical edge, have your crews work standing on where the tread will be and cutting in line with the tread. We'll practice that a lot on our field days. Um, it definitely feels, when you first get out there, and especially for unexperienced crew members, much easier to stand on your fill slope and just pull all that material down. You can get a lot of tread built very quickly that way, um, but it obscures your critical edge and makes it almost impossible to know exactly where that is so that you're, you don't know if, what your bench is actually doing. And it really does, it creates a lot of disturbance on that down slope. And when we're building trails, we want the first visitors who come on that trail, you know, even if it's a week later, to have the feeling that this trail has been there for years. Um, and if it just looks like a rubble heap for the first you know, 15 feet below the trail, um, number one, it's gonna diminish the trail experience. Number two, all that rubble, all that disturbed soil is the perfect environment for invasive species. Um, all the cheat grasses and you know, thistles and um, crazy mustards and whatever else we've got in Colorado, um, many of those species ride in on us, you know, on our shoelaces and our socks. Um, that's how they get transported around. And if we're creating the perfect bed, seed bed for them right next to the perfect transport, um, we are going to create a lot of problems with invasives along our brand new trail. And uh, so we want to try to avoid that. We'll, we'll emphasize that quite a bit, Nate, as I know you're familiar with that, but it's the difference between hacking a fire line and creating a finished tread that somebody that afternoon, that evening says, what have you guys been doing here all day? It looks like it's been here for two years. You can't get a better compliment. We'll work on it. Absolutely. Uh, and we'll practice that a lot. Like I said, it, it, it's a hard concept to, to get to begin with, and it, it certainly is hard to build, um, but the end product will be much better. Um, describing your rocks, that gets back to our discussion about the, the partial bench. Um, if you send your, your crews out rock shopping, don't tell them, go get me some big rocks. Um, you will get various definitions of big rocks. Um, Give them descriptions. Say, I want, um, I want rocks the size of a cantaloupe, or I want rocks the size of a, I like to use fruit for the smaller size. You know, if I need fill rocks, I'm, I'm looking for plums and peaches and maybe some grapes. Um, if I'm looking for rock walls, I might move up into appliances and look for, you know, toasters and microwaves and, Small um, apartment size refrigerators. Yes, we have gotten into you know some of those massive refrigerators in some of our projects. Um, but give them something that people will understand the dimensions of. Um, that way you get the rocks you want. Um, even tell them the shapes you're looking for. Say I'm looking for something with, you know, 
lots of angulation on it, or I'm looking for flat faces because we're building a rock wall. Um, I, want, I want you to go out there and find me some cinder blocks. Um, give them good descriptors of your rocks, otherwise they'll spend a lot of time finding rocks and then you'll have a lot of rocks you can't use. Um, look for bottlenecks through the course of the day. Um, there are periods of time in the trail construction, like if you have people gung-ho and they're just building a bunch of roughed in tread and then everybody comes back and is doing finish work, you won't have enough work to do for everybody to be busy. So keep in mind those points in the day where the work is going to be, we're gonna have people standing around and, and come up with things for them to do. Um, maybe once you're a third of the way through your, your construction and go ahead and have some people go back and start the finish work on, on the 30 feet you already built. Uh, and that way you're going through in kind of a wave and everybody is feeling you know, like they're contributing. Uh, one of the worst experiences for volunteers um, is feeling that they like they haven't contributed to the to the day. Uh, it's not like a paid crew where they'd like to stand around as much as they can possibly manage. You know, if we're working for the state, nobody here works for the state, do they? No. Okay. I used to work for the state. Um, state classified. You know, you're looking for a place to sit. Um, on volunteer projects, people want to contribute. They want to be part of the. They don't want to stand around, and they will get disheartened very quickly if they feel like they're just standing around waiting for something to happen. So keep your crews busy. Um, you're the decider. Um, <clears throat> trail projects more than any other type of volunteer uh, restoration event, the crew leader has a lot of say in what goes on and, and the, the final design for their sections. Because um, we don't know when we're going through and designing a trail, what is underneath the surface. We can't, you know, dig down every 18 inches and, and figure out, oh, there's 12 inches of duff here, or, boy, this is really rocky here, or, oh, there was an underground flow here that we didn't expect. So there's going to be a lot of things, and as you develop your experience and your trail knowledge, you're going to have a lot of say as a, as a crew leader as to how that trail ends up looking in the end. Um, so it's really exciting from, from that standpoint. Um, that being said, check with the TA if there's anything that's going to significantly alter the, the line of the trail. Um, make sure that the, the drainage is, is not being altered and, and have your TA check that for you. And finally, always admire your work. <laughs> Do it with your crews. Give them that final boost at the end of the day because, or at the end of the section because probably you have another section and, and that gives them the, you know, the motivation to do just as well on the next 100 feet. Questions there? Anything to add, you know, co-instructors? Well, let, let folks add <clears throat> any questions they have, but I do have some comments. Absolutely. Go ahead, Bobby or Kate, <laughs> anything? Yeah, I, I had just kind of a question a little bit around num number three, keeping the sill slope clean. Um, and like you said, I, I'm just having a little trouble like visualizing what I guess uh, mishaps can occur um, like when you're down slope and pulling material um, I, if you could kind of re-explain a little bit about that work in line with the tread sort of bullet sure um, boy, um, we, we call it toes on tread you know you're standing in the tread basically pulling all the material into the middle of the tread for dispersal or for uh, raking out. Uh, okay. We don't stand off to the side, downhill, down slope, and just yank it over, yard it over the edge. Number one, we're kind of burying the critical edge, and as, as Nate said, it's, you're creating a trash zone that could be 10 Probably. feet wide. So when you're looking down the trail, you don't have a two foot wide trail visually, you have a 10 foot wide trail full of three-fourths of it full of debris and of course it's a, a real um, habitat for invasive weeds again so you're you're going to be I will emphasize this you can do 95 percent of your work for the most part standing on that tread and pulling it towards you it's actually very efficient and uh, doesn't take as long and you will not be double handling any of that because if you yard it over the critical edge, you're going to be cleaning that critical edge later. 
And yeah, it's and almost I, impossible to pull all that stuff out of vegetation oh, yeah. causing a lot of damage. Can I also add on to that? Yes, please. Sure. Um, and it's also just a really great method. I mean, when you're doing trail work and trail projects, I mean, typically, depending on the project, if you also have a restoration, an ecological restoration portion of it as well, some somewhere else along the trail, and that um, that dirt and that soil that you're picking up can easily be used and transported to another location to where you're working. And if you don't have that soil with you, you're you're searching for it in a place that could be useful and that wouldn't upset the terrain and all of that. So I mean, it's useful for a bunch of different reasons. Exactly. Excellent point because. Everything that you pull off, whether it's duff, organic matter, mineral soil, pebbles, rocks, that you pull out of that tread to create that tread, it could have a use. And you're going to be the decider who says, okay, the specifications say stockpile this or that here at this end for future use by an adjacent crew, for example. So it's not all yard it up, pull it towards the middle of the trail, pick it up in a shovel and widely disperse it may have a use. Those will be clear, I think, in the uh, uh, project details or the project, uh, uh, the, 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 the trail details on that. Perfect. What I wanted to mention here is, you know, we're getting into where crew leaders, because this is a crew leader training, what is one of the biggest mistakes they make? Any idea, Kate or, or Bobby? You know, look at all the things you have to kind of keep track of. What's what's a big mistake you might consider making? Find yourself trapped into. We all do it. Yeah. I don't know. I feel like I don't know if this is what you're getting at, but to me, it seems like the larger your crew is, the more likely it is that somebody is going to do something that isn't one of these steps. And how do you anticipate that? What is your role as a crew leader? Is it gonna be completely tool in hand, digging to China, creating that tread? Or is it gonna be demonstrating, mentoring, coaching, stepping back, reviewing, you know, walking up and down that line, getting some uh, COVID mask FaceTime, but <laughs> whatever it takes, checking in on people so you're guiding the outcome. It really becomes time and task and, uh, management. You know, beginning of the day, you're going to get a lot of people with energy. I want to do this. I want to do that. I just put a tool in my hand. Others will be a little bit uh, laid back. You'll be managing, helping them manage the energy, utilizing that. Those people with great energy, if you need rock shopping, whoa, they're the ones to stick with that. <laughs> we, will talk, we will talk about how we manage all those aspects of crew, how we continually assess our crews moving forward. So I think you're on the right track thinking about that, Kate. I actually have a, a rock question. You know, in the event that you do need your like washing machine rock, how do you, well, one, how do you know that you're going to be able to find one? And two, how do you remove that? Because it's presumably much of that is in the ground. So like, how are you not disrupting things substantially having to dig out these gigantic mm. rocks? And then also even if you start digging and it turns out it's only the size of a microwave, but, or vice versa, you know, how do you deal with the, the rock thing? Yeah, that's a good question. And one of the things we look at when, when doing the design is availability of materials. Um, and so that'll be whatever possible built into the design and um, in your section notes, um, you know, when we're building trail through heavy vegetation where rocks aren't available, um, it does change the way, you know, things we can get away with because we're not going to be able to build as many rock walls. Um, if there's a talus field just upslope and we have ample supply of big, heavy, flat rocks, you know, we may, you know, do a little more daring design uh, where we know we can build tall, stable walls with, with good material. Um, there, there are techniques to uh, shopping for rocks. Also, if you pull a big rock out of a hillside and it's nowhere near the tread, you've created a gap or a hole in there. How do you reclaim that hole? There's a little reclamation work that we recommend for that. 
don't want to forget about it. Uh, so I think those are better addressed in the field. Uh, please feel free to bring those up. Yeah, we always want to try to reclaim any damage we've done. Um, and, you know, like we were saying before, if we can get our materials out of the tread we're building. So as we're digging, as we're building the tread, we're going to run into rocks, right? I mean, that's, we're in the Rocky Mountains, there are going to be rocks. So we, instead of just trundling those rocks down the hill, which is fun, um, dangerous maybe, but, you know, it's, it can be fun. Um, we're going to take those rocks and we're going to place them uphill of the tread and come back and if we need rocks later on we'll have an ample supplier right there um, easy an easy grab if not you know we can probably use those rocks we can crush them down to use as fill we can use them for reclamation of areas if we had to dig a a, a barrel pit um, we almost always use all the rock we find when we're big when we're digging a trail um, it's almost always a shortage of rocks so um, making sure any good materials we're, we're unearthing while constructing, we're putting those aside and, and, and keeping them for, for other things. Good questions. Great questions. All right, let's, uh, we are eight slides through 16. Yahoo. <laughs> so we're gonna go, um, I think there'll hopefully be fewer questions, fewer points on the next few. Uh, trail documents. Nobody ever wants to ask questions about trail documents. So uh, this will go quick. Um, these are the basic documents that you'll be, that you will have on your, um, on your trail projects as a crew leader. You'll have crew leader notes, section notes. These are different and we'll go into some of that. An emergency response plan. And then there'll be maybe a land management agency documents. Uh, often number four here, uh, is not something we put in the hands of crew leaders, but you may be made aware of it, or it may, um, and those documents are the job site hazard analysis and maybe a trail specs document that we use to generate uh, our notes and emergency response plans. Kate or Bobby, have you seen examples of these uh, documentation on any of the projects you've been on? I've, I've seen that. people filling them out, I think, but no. No, I haven't seen them myself. Okay. See them in person next weekend. <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I was just going to ask Jackie, is that something, Jackie, you need me to pull together as examples, or do you have some that you're going to? Uh, we've already printed out example emergency response plans, um, yeah, but we have not created an example JHA or anything like that. And I believe Jeffrey might be the one creating those trail notes for us. I'd have to confirm. We'll talk on Wednesday about that one. Very good. All right, well, here's an example of technical notes from last year's training. Um, we were building some trail in Campbell Valley. Um, not a typical place we'd build trail or a typical landscape. So it was definitely an interesting build, but the basic information you're gonna find in your technical notes is, yeah, this first page here is an overview, maybe some history of the space, uh, defining the problem we're addressing, why, the, the why behind the what. Um, then we'll go into some project details, like where's the project? Who's gonna be on the project? Who are your resources? Maybe some maps. Uh, there's always a section on safety, um, specific safety concerns for the site that we're working in. Um, then what are our communications? Um, are we going to have radios? Uh, do we have cell phone reception? Um, are we working so close together that we don't need any kind of, you know, ancillary communication devices? Uh, on trail projects, that's very rarely the case. Uh, what happens in the event of an incident or injury? Um, then we'll go into a description of the work, more maps. Uh, in this case, there are section notes embedded in the technical notes. Um, that only really works in a very small project, like a, a training. Um, tool lists, what tools are you gonna need for your crews? Um, some basic information, you know, this is, the rest of this document in this case is just the generic uh, description of how to build a trail and some examples of some structures we might be using. 
Um, all that should be built into your, your technical notes. Now you right, moving on, this is what section notes look like. This is actually the, the same section notes we just saw embedded in those technical notes. Um, for each 100 foot section, oh, this is a getting exciting. Um, the section is broken down. Maybe, uh, so section, section zero, this is a 100 foot section. Um, we're building um, trail right in the toe slope of the, of the uh, cross slope, no special directions. Material disposal, we're bagging the, all the material to the steps at the end of section one. Apparently they need some fill, the fill material over there. Um, notes, we're building basic trail. Um, also here are descriptions of the flagging. Um, so we'll have blue flags wherever we're, we're, we're wanting some drainage. Red pin flags are <laughs> places we know there'll be rock structures needed. Um, a double orange flag, means stop building here. Uh, green pin flags along the critical edge to define the tread. Um, there may be in the notes sections, uh, notes on specific hazards for this section. Uh, maybe there's poison ivy here. Maybe there's a hornet's nest in the rocks. Um, often, this is a very simplified uh, section note here. Often there'll be section zero and then zero plus 20, that's zero, section zero, 20 feet from the beginning, you might have a rock wall in this section and specific information about that rock wall. Uh, <laughs> it may even include where you might find the rocks. There's a talus field just beyond section two, uh, full of perfect rocks. Use your, your rock sling to, uh, to carry rocks through section two once it's completed. Um, this kind of information is really important. And you know, somebody's put a lot of thought into this and rather than sending your crews just in a general you know, scatter plot uh, pattern to try to find your materials, those may already have been identified for you. And somebody in section three may be expecting you to bring them a bunch of fill material for work that they're doing in that section as well. Uh, questions on the, on the section notes? Now you may think that this is all this technical notes and section notes are overkill. Why can't we just grab tools, go out and whack trail? But this really speaks to the professional approach that WRV uh, takes to this. And this, is, this really speaks well for the partnerships developed with the Forest Service or with the counties we work with, et cetera. This is a mark of professionalism, and I say this coming from a, a construction management background, that this lends itself to really guiding the outcome, guiding the outcomes. So it's, it's a very important aspect of it. Uh, will you as a crew leader generally be generating these? No, the project team will, but you should be made aware of these, and your expectation from your project team is have them before project day so that you can review them. Hopefully there's an orientation. We'll talk about the process a little bit more later. And if you are interested in helping with some of this design, you know, that, that can, first of all, can be really educational and it can help you get orientation early to the site. Um, but there is often opportunity to come out and, and assist on, in the design. We need, even if you don't feel like you have any you know, skill to offer yet. Uh, we need people to hold the end of the tape measure and to, to drive in stakes and to take notes. And it's a really great way to learn the in-depth process that goes into designing a trail and can, can help you as a leader, as a crew leader, to have a deeper understanding in all the, all the work you do, not just the ones you help design, uh, about what went into it and why decisions were made and, uh, and then we'll probably invite you to be a technical advisor in the next training. Uh, other questions? All right. Uh, the emergency response plan. Hopefully, we will hand this to you at the beginning of the day and you will gaze over it just a little bit until your eyes glaze over. Um, 
and then you will stick fold it up and stick it in your back pocket and never see it again until you've washed your work pants and it's this balled up linty mess in, in your back pocket. Um, but it's important that everybody, every crew leader has this document with them throughout the entire project. Um, I always create my ERPs as one page front and back, so you can do just that. You separate it out from your crew leader notes. Uh, do not just leave it in your backpack with the, the section notes and the technical notes. Uh, keep this on your person because this has information you may need on the fly, like what is the number for the nearest hospital and how do I get there? And um, what who do I communicate with if something happens? Um, this is information you don't want in your backpack on section three when you are having lunch with the people over in, in section 12. Um, you want it in your back pocket. Um, I won't go into detail everything here, but you know it has basic project information and contact information. Then it has what are your resources in, in an emergency? You know, can you make a phone call from, you know, do you have cell reception? Is there a payphone close by? Uh, those still exist, by the way. Um, you know, do we have four service radios? Um, the steps to take in an emergency, what is your responsibility uh, during an emergency as a crew leader? Um, all that information is in this document. Um, you'll get examples of it during the training. Uh, again, hopefully you'll never have to use one of these documents. They, they fortunately for us get used very rarely. Uh, but we always want to make sure they're there and that all of our crew leaders have them during the entire uh, course of the project. May, uh, may I mention that uh, this points out kind of a, a chain of command situation here. You have a project team that technically is responsible for uh, how things get done. And you saw that in the example of the construction notes and the technical notes and the section notes. Uh, that's all you know, project chain of command. The medical chain of command may be different, and this document that you will keep in your pocket identifies who's, who's at the top of this chain, who has the say-so as the project medic, who are other people who are medically qualified for go-to and serious things beyond a Band-Aid. So just be aware there's, there's two, there's two kind of chains of command, medical and project. We'll, we'll kind of go through that a little bit more and emphasize that as well. Does that make sense to you, Kate, Bobby? All right, I see, see the eyes glazing over a little bit with all the paperwork. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. We'll cover some more of this and give you some examples in the actual field training. Um, but let's move on to something more exciting. The tools. trail tools. Um, we don't have time to go in depth into each and every possible tool you might use on the trail and you will get an opportunity um, to go more in depth in your field days, um, doing the, the tool safety talks and practicing those. Uh, but basically we want to just introduce the concept here. Um, you know, there are some basic tool categories to be aware of. Um, you know, we have cutting tools and those are, you know, like the pruners and the loppers and the saws. Um, we have um, earth moving tools and those are the uh, you know the shovels and the McLeods and um, the brewery blankets and wheelbarrows. Um, these are for earth moving and then we have our digging tools and, and these are anything we're using to disrupt material that doesn't want to be disrupted. Um, so our, obviously our, our pickmatics are probably our primary digging tool but also maybe the backside of a Pulaski or um, you know, even a, a sledge can be considered, a, a, a single jack can be considered a digging tool or maybe pounding through rocks. Um, <clears throat> and finally, we have some specialty tools like the, the, um, the rock Austin, where we're using um, a tool to move rocks that you know, one person alone could not carry. Uh, we can use these with as many as, as six or sometimes even eight people to move rocks that are um, you know, 400 pounds um, in, a, in pretty extreme situations. Um, you'll get a chance to practice with the majority of these tools in your field days. Um, 
but I just wanted to get them out there. Um, some of these tools are, are new to folks who haven't done trail building before. Um, don't be too terribly concerned about getting all the names right. It's more important that you get the, the, the use of the tool. Um, you have an understanding of the usage of the tool. Uh, for example, we're not using the shovels as a digging tool. Um, unless we're planting you know, ve vegetables in the garden. Um, on a trail project, shovels are just removing soil that's already been disrupted. Um, the digging is to be done with something with a little more weight and, and, a, and something a little sturdier like a, like a pickmatic. Questions on tools? All right. Um, I might mention here quickly that uh, this leads into what we call the tool cuss. And I don't know if that's a following slide or not, but you're going to have to manage time in the parking lot and on site for explaining how people can carry, use, store, and and utilize and 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 utilize these tools safely. Carry, use, store, and safety. So uh, we have some techniques we can show you. You're going to get to practice how to present a tool talk, a safety talk. You know how to cuss your tools, but you're going to be cognizant of time. Do I have? five minutes to get people rolling in the parking lot or do I have 15 minutes because we're waiting for something? So there, there's a time management element of how much time do you take to explain the tools. And in the carry use store and safety, if you're in the parking lot and you're not on the trail digging, out of those four elements, carry use, store and safety, which one do you think you're gonna go very light on until you're on trail? the actual usage. You're not gonna be digging out the parking lot, are you? So we'll discuss that, and I'm sorry to take up too much time there, Nate. No worries, and I didn't create a slide for, for the cuss, but, um, oh, that doesn't work. Oh, that was my key card. <laughs> It'll be in your key cards, uh, the, the description of the cuss, the carry use, storage, and safety. Uh, and we'll go through that in depth, and you will, you will practice that ad nauseum. Um, on your, your field weekend. All right, some other tools. Uh, we've got some specialty tools that find their way on the trail projects. Um, if you're using tools like this, make sure you're getting uh, specific instruction. Um, and this is for driving T posts. We often have to put up fences. Um, we're having to do more rock shaping than one can do with a sledgehammer. Um, the um, rotary hammer is the way to go. And we, we now have a canny comb that we can use for moving really you know, pretty massive materials. It has a thousand pound capacity um, along already constructed trails. So uh, these are resources that we have and, and may be available on trail projects. Uh, and if you find yourself in a situation where one of these things is necessary, um, make sure you're checking with your tool manager and your technical advisor to get the right instruction. Um, I got another slide. Uh, and finally, rigging tools. We have added more and more rigging capacity to WRV's uh, tool cache. Um, and Kate, this goes to, to some of your question about how do we get a really big rock the size of a refrigerator. Um, we're obviously not doing it by hand. And, and in today's you know, physical distancing environment, we're not even doing it with a bunch of people with rock bars anymore because that puts us all too close together. Um, so we'll be using tools that give us mechanical advantage. Um, like uh, this one, there's a, we're using a, a two to one uh, to give us a little mechanical advantage just with some pulleys. Um, and here we're using a, um, a grip hoist. Um, this grip hoist has, can, you know, can move um, up to two tons uh, safely with just one person operating it. Uh, so we have these tools in, these uh, situations where we really need to move a lot of material or big material, we can set up high lines to more efficiently um, repeatedly move material around on basically a, a controlled zip line. Um, and if we are planning on using these materials, these tools on a project, you'll be getting specific instruction in their use and they have a lot of oversight um, in your section from a technical advisor until you become comfortable with them. Are either of you uh, climbers, by the way, Kate, Bobby? 
I have, but not in a while. <laughs> Only trees for me, but I do enjoy gym rock climbing, but yeah. Not, not using uh, rigging equipment, classical? No, no, no experience in that, but I'd be up for, I guess I, for filming, I've done a little bit I, now that I think about it, but nothing, nothing with rock work for sure. Well, we do have some people on uh, as volunteers, crew leaders, and, and instructors who are uh, come have a climbing background, and to have that cross training really comes in handy for rigging. So, uh, if I was just wondering if you had that background or interest, looking for the next rigger. We're not close to rigger yet, there, Mick. Nope, nope. We're going to stick with the basics for now. All right, well, that's, that's all I've got, and we are officially out of time. Um, but if you have any questions, I'm, I'm happy to hang out um, for the rest of the afternoon. The only quick one I had was just a reminder question uh, was about when are the field days again? I was just trying to recall those dates. I couldn't dig them up in my email. Sure, so the, the first field day is, is actually this, is the a week, a week from tomorrow. Yeah, so that's, that's tomorrow, but the following Saturday. Yeah, it's not not this Saturday, but the following week. The following Saturday okay. is our event at Eldo. Uh, and then we have one in Loveland, and that isn't until the end of June. Yeah, I'm gonna have to look at my calendar. That's too far away. That, about and that that's let me pull I think I have that one on my calendar. That's the one that I'm planning to go to. Hmm. Hmm. Twenty seven. Yeah, so the 27th. Okay. Cool. Questions, Ian? Uh, no, I don't think so. I, I like a little more hands on before I start asking questions. Sure, sure. I ask a lot in the field. Um, I might just leave as parting words here that uh, you know, part of your crew leader training, again, and I'm alluding back to your coaching, your mentoring, your demonstrating, et cetera, is going to be. Uh, what we call soft skills, the people skills, how to keep people um, happily engaged, how to anticipate the, the work. You don't have, have to be the greatest technician. Uh, you don't have to, to know how to do everything. That's what hopefully a competent technical advisor is going to be able to help you with. Uh, so that's not to say we won't be doing any work at all. But we're going to differentiate and focus mostly on the soft skills in a hard skill, technical skill environment. That's what the field day is for. So just I'm trying to set expectations. That's a large part of your job as a crew leader is managing people's expectations, setting expectations, so that people are clear in the communication process. Thanks, Mick. Yeah, yeah and if you haven't, if you missed the other Zoom sessions that were dealing with, you know, managing your crew and conflict uh, resolution or conflict management or all those other sessions that have occurred over the last month, please go back and watch those videos. We'll be using the, that same terminology in the field session to facilitate this, um, this type of learning. And so um, it's important that you at least uh, you know, get some exposure to the to the terminology and, and the way that we'll be framing um, the scenarios that that you'll be working on in the field days. Good point, um, Jackie. Would you be able to uh, provide me those links? I I kind of committed late to to this process, so I was not. I don't remember receiving the links for those. Uh, just so I can be on the same page as the trainees. The links as far as our example document? Yeah, the, the other documents Nate was referring to. And the videos that we have? Yeah, yeah, please. Or is it part of the resource online? I actually, I don't have those links personally, but I can connect you with Rachel who has all of those links. And I'll, I'll, I'll CC you in an email. It, it may be under leadership resources. I'll just have to dive into it. Yeah, Rachel's been managing all okay. communication with the, the, the trainees on that. And so um, she'll have the, the links and, and be able to get you set up with that. Okay, thank you. That's all I have. All right, any other questions? 
Think I'm good? All right, well, thank you so much for being a great audience. I'm glad we at least got a few people to interact with. Otherwise, <laughs> this has been super boring on the video later on. <laughs> um, so everybody else has got to thank um, Ian, Kate, and Bobby for, um, for being here to interact with the, uh, the otherwise very boring instructors. <laughs> Thanks, Rob. Well, sense in the dirt. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you so much, guys. Uh, well, thank you all. Look forward to work with you in the field. Thank yeah. you. Jackie. See you later. Excited. Bye. Bye. Bye.